My name is Greg Brzezinski, and I am the acting director of the Seeger Center for Asian Studies here at the Elliott School. The objective of the Seeger Center is to try to promote the best Asia-related Asia research and uh, teaching in the Washington, D.C. area, and to serve as a hub that connects academics and policymakers that are interested in Asia. I would also like to say for everybody who's joining us that um, if you are still an undergraduate or still looking for a place to uh, do an MA, especially an MA in Asian Studies, the Elliott School has one of the best programs in Asian Studies uh, in the Washington area. It's the only school in the DC area that is recognized as a Title VI National Resource Center by the Department of Education. And it is the only institution in the DC area with its own Institute for Korean Studies. Um, let me uh, introduce tonight's topic and speaker. As all of you know, uh, Shinzo Abe dominated Japanese politics for nearly a decade. He was a fairly conservative figure. I think his governance was marked by relatively good relations with the United States, but not as good uh, relations with some other uh, important players in the region, especially um, the, the two Koreas and China. So um, we're, we're today, though, um, uh, recently, of course, um, the Abe Suga era has sort of ended. And we now have uh, a new Japanese leader, Fumia Kishida. And, you know, we're sort of wondering what does this mean for Japan? What does it mean for Japanese foreign policy? And to talk about this discuss to talk about this topic, we have an excellent expert joining us from Japan, uh, Professor Misato Matsuoka, who is an associate professor of international affairs at Tokyo University and one of the leading young experts in Japan on Japanese international relations, foreign policy, and diplomacy. So she is going to talk for about 30 minutes. While she is talking, you can, um, the, the, if you have questions, um, I will probably moderate the Q&A after she's done speaking. So the best way is to send your question privately through the chat to Nora Heffernan, right? So um, look up her name and send her a question if you have it, and she will uh, be sending the questions to me. All right, well, thank you again for joining us this evening. I am going to turn the floor over now to Professor Matsuoka. Thank you so much, Greg, for introducing me. So I'm Misato Matsuoka. So let me share the PowerPoint of for the today's talk. So I hope you can see it properly. So um, as you can see from the title, uh, well, today we have a new Japanese Prime Minister, uh, Fumio Kishida, but they have been, uh, quite a few kind of question mark about uh, his own um, security policy making, and because Abe Shinzo exert a lot of influence and also um, change some of the Japanese security policy making. So people have been questioning um, how further Abe legacy have remains, um, even the Kishida administration has started. So um, before um, entering, um, you know, my, like focusing on, you know, the Kishida's uh, thinking and this, what kind of uh, attempt he have been made in, um, I would like to kind of um, introduce about the idea on the conservatism and the realism in Japan. So um, indeed, there have been this um, quite a few of this idea of this, you know, grassroots um, conservatism in Japan recent years. So this also kind of coming from the idea of the, you know, seeing the rise of China as a threat. And then having said that, because Japan have been enhancing its own kind of defense, um, kind of, or, well, kind of defense capabilities, um, there have been some experts wondering about the, you know, because Japan 
has seen as a country, which is uniquely have a peace constitution. So like, there have been this question about whether Japan has not become a pacifist country anymore. So this is one of the kind of um, article that mentioned even that Japan pacifism may have died. But um, still, there have been this ongoing kind of discussion about, you know, how further, you know, Japan have changed its defense posture. But um, one of the kind of perspective I may want to um, adopt might be this idea that indeed, even though we do see this kind of emerging like conservative, like uh, kind of idea from the grassroots level um seeing the chinese rise but indeed um well like i won't be explaining in details in this regard but well domestically speaking well the media have kind of played a, a role of kind of really maybe like um exaggerating this kind of china threat so indeed this kind of foreign policy making and security policy making of japan has been quite elite driven rather than kind of reflecting to uh, from the grassroots sentiment and public opinion. So I may want to focus on this kind of knowledge production of security discourses, especially looking into how the political elites, what well, that is like Japanese politicians or so, um, like um, the kind of politician um, like within like Kishida administration. So um, I think, um, most of you are attending this um, um, lecture because you're quite interested about Kishida, um, like you know what kind of you know thinking he might have. So uh, I would like to try to un unveil of you know like how um, like what kind of um, factors might have shaped his um, thinking and also his attitudes to the security um, policy making, and well. It is still like kind of work in progress um, um, that I have been trying to analyze about um, the security policy making on the Kishida administration. But the factors that I will be looking into, well, importantly, I think quite a few of you are quite interested in how further other legacy may remain, um, even uh, like in the post um, Abe period. But I think it is quite important for us to understand about, you know, um, like who is Kishida is or what kind of thinking he has. And well, Kishida also been uh, like, you know, he also involved as a foreign minister during the Abe administration. So indeed, um, um, how should I put this? Um, even though uh, Kishida, uh, I will explain later, but Kishida um, claimed himself that he has a different uh, kind of political ideology from Abe, which he tried to distinguish from himself from Abe. But having said that, well, his kind of foreign policy thinking may have been shaped by his experience as a foreign minister. So I think it is quite important to take into account of that factor. But, you know, it is quite complicated factors that I will be taking into account. Another important thing that we need to keep in mind is that, well, even though it is said that Japan, um, like Japanese politics may not become like faction center that, you know, like even on the recent election show that, well, maybe the, this faction is not the kind of uh, major component to consider because, you know, the young politician may have started to say that, oh, we need to kind of um, uh, support the politician we think we need to support for. So while there have been this kind of changing, like especially the younger um, Japanese politicians to focus on faction, but nonetheless, faction still matters. And Kishida has been the leader of the Kochikai, which is known as a, a so-called like dovish or um, the liberal uh, mindset. So um, I would like to kind of, you know, take into account how further this kind of the element of coach kind might um, kind of um, influence or have shaped Kishida's um, policy making. But um, lastly, um, it is quite important to look at the well, I may not be able to kind of draw the details about it, but uh, you know, because now, well, Kishida is both the prime minister, you know, he's currently the prime minister of Japan and um, LDP is uh, the kind of major political party. So, you know, 
he also needs to take into account other of this LDP lawmakers idea regarding the foreign policy making. So I will try to kind of draw, um, draw on that point. So um, I think um, most of you are very familiar about Abe legacy. Well, well, I won't be um, explaining in details here, but um, these are the like, basically they might be a two achievement. Um, Abe have um, made and also left as a legacy. So one is uh, certainly this kind of change in security policy making he made. So importantly, he um, kind of created uh, under Abe administration, he created this National Security Council and this National Security Secretariat. And also um, he also kind of uh, released uh, like under Abe administration, well, you know, um, it's kind of tried to kind of show a clear Japan um, foreign policy posture by introducing the concepts such as a, what well, I call it proactive pacifism, but the kind of, you know, um, this proactive contribution to peace. But there have been other um, kind of achievements he have made. And well, it is really widely known, I think, internationally that what well, Abe have been one of the kind of really uh, the leader to kind of um, introduce this idea of in the, well, not really the in the Pacific, but free and open in the Pacific. And today we do see um, like not only like United States or Quad members, but other like European states also start to mention this importance of the FOIP. And um, another um, element I may want to touch upon regarding Abe maybe achievement is um, even though this is something that he has kind of um, take into account seriously, but this idea of economic security has become important. And during Abe administration, um, this is due to the rise of China. However, uh, I may want to also touch upon even under Kishida, what this economic security is seen quite important. So, um, and I it, there have been also this kind of you know um, speculation that maybe Abe may remain as a kind of really the shadow shogun um, even after Kishida administration, well, especially during the LDP presidential election, well, there have been this kind of rumor of the influence of Abe. And um, during um, this presidential, LDP presidential election, well, there have been this kind of, you know, idea that, okay, um, like how Abe might be supporting the candidates. And indeed, uh, when uh, Abe showed his support to um, Takaichi, uh, that's kind of made this kind of the support of Kishida to kind of make it seriously for the race. Well, not only Kishida, but even um, Kono who lost the, um, on the election, um, like it has been kind of, you know, like Abe seemed to exert uh, quite a few influence. But in, um, later on, I will explain Play on um, whether how further this Abe influence remains under Kishida administration policy making. So let me introduce um, uh, Humio Kishida. Um, there might be some of you who are really familiar if you're uh, you if you have been studying about Japanese politics. But um, he has um elect, uh, he started to um. Uh, kind of joined as a politician um, after being elected to the House of Representatives in 1993, representing Hiroshima. And he, um, since 2012, um, he has been the leader of the Kochikai, which is uh, one of the kind of um, old um, Japanese faction. And um, this is a faction created by um, the former Prime Minister Hayato Ikeda. Um, but this um, faction is might be quite unique compared to other Japanese faction. Although um, it's do, uh, it is said that it's maintained its kind of the idea of its mainstream conservative, but it is also known as a faction that can be considered as like kind of liberal dove in the foreign policy stance and even like pro-China um, considering the former prime minister who belonged to this faction such as um, um, Ohira, for example. Um, but another interesting thing that um, Kishida mentions that, um, so um, he, and it is said that Coach Kai has uh, quite a few uh, politician who is from Hiroshima. So uh, Hiroshima is the prefecture which is famous for the atomic bombing. So there are this kind of really um, like maybe like some of the politicians can be seen as the kind of pacifist mindset and so forth. But another interesting thing that um, Kishida mentioned when talking about his like maybe his 
um, um, I thought by his political thinking is that in fact, well, he do say that um, he do, you know, he's proudly been um, um, played its role as a Kochikai leader, but he also said that, you know, Yoshida um, has been also another like, important um, figure who has kind of really influenced Japanese politics. So even though well, Yoshida is not like, the, wasn't a member of Kochikai, but it is seen that, you know, this kind of Yoshida um, like, kind of idea seem to be carried out at least by Kishida. So let me turn on to the next slide. So these are like kind of recent two books that Kishida um, published and one. Um, as you see from the title, it is quite um, like really stressing of promoting the nuclear non-proliferation. Although in fact, while he kind of support for the disarmament within the framework of NPT, but indeed there is this kind of um, criticism from um, some people saying that he doesn't support for the no first use of policy. So yeah, you do see this kind of really complicated um, position, but um, he um, kind of um, clearly mentioned about what kind of political stance he do say uh, he do have. But another interesting thing that I found from this book is that he claimed himself as a pro-American and liberal conservative, like liberal conservative. You do see this is quite a uh, kind of really quite contradictory, but it is quite, um, well, maybe like kind of not surprising um, terminology to see that especially for those who are yeah, I consider this a conservative, but think that um, U.S. alliance is important. Um, yeah, they tend to label themselves like liberal conservatives. And it is quite interesting that you do see this word in this book. And another recent book uh, that was published in October, although this is a renewal of the previous book that was published a few years ago, is yeah, um, is this um, um, like the title that mentioned about from division to cooperation, but he also mentioned about the needs for like not focusing on confrontation, but also the cooperation. And another um, like distinctive um, um, characteristic that he has mentioned is that um, his um, approach will be not, will be only top down, but it is important to like, I think, um, for those who have been following Japanese politics after Kishida became a prime minister, uh, he said that um, the power of listening, like in Japanese, like kikuchika is very important. So this is coming for, from his ideas that it is important to take into account the people's voice. So this is why um, I translated from Japanese. So the this translation might appear a bit awkward, but you know he said that it is important to kind of you know approach like both top down and bottom up, like which he said, like properly approaching like both sides. So this is um his approach. And well, he didn't really clearly mention this, but maybe he is trying to distinguish him from Abe that, you know, because during Abe administration, when this defense or security policy making was changed, uh, it wasn't really the bottom up, but it was quite top down and the, you know, so and that is why we saw the news that opposition uh, kind of really voices was seen in front of the diet. So um, yes, um, he, as I mentioned earlier, well, he served as a foreign minister on the um, Shinzo Abe administration from 2012 to 2017. And also he did kind of involve in this kind of first um, like um, visit um, like to Hiroshima by um, the former president Barack Obama. And, but he also mentioned that uh, you know, like when kind of talking about um, his relationship with Abe, um, he kind of um, distinguished himself from Abe in the sense that he said, well, the, at the time, well, Abe was the prime minister, but he was saying that, well, the, you know, Abe, well, the prime minister is conservative, there I say, uh, like, hawkish. But on the other hand, Kishida himself is um, liberal dovish. Um, this is a translation I kind of took from um, Tobias um, Harris, like which he released in the recent article. But this is a comment he mentioned in 2017. And I think it is also quite important to see um, the policy that has been, or the kind of idea 
of the Coach Kai. And the, this is um, taken from the Coach Kai's uh, website. And here, uh, well, like on this website, it introduced like K-Wish, like it's taken from the kind of the capital of each word. And regarding the foreign policy making, well, Kishida, um, like under Kishida um, leadership, he um, like they claim that they will kind of promote for the humane diplomacy. So um, this is based upon the kind of the humane diplomacy based upon the peace constitution, um, US Japan Alliance, and the self defense forces. But in addition to that, well, I also translated some of the the small explanation which is provided here, but well, it was, yeah, uh, on this website um, of the Kochika, it's also mentioned that well, Japan will be a like, play a role of promoting peace, democracy, and so forth. And also by build, like, will build in like East Asian platform among Ch Japan, China, and Korea to address the common issues, including like environment and so forth. So you do see that there's a kind of strong stress on the kind of democracy and, and a well, humane element of the foreign policy making. But this is a, um, another um, kind of, you know, um, um, ideas which has been released on the Kishida's um, um, uh, official uh, website when showing his um, idea for foreign policy making and security. I also translated it on my own. So I hope it's, it do kind of um, uh, um, accurately translate, but he said that he will create the, or he will kind of develop the diplomacy security based on the trust and the three pillars of determination. Well, the kakugo was the word that I translated. So there are like three pillars that one is the determination to protect democracy. So that relates to the issue of the, the stability to Taiwan Strait and also human rights issue and Uyghur. And the second was this determination to protect Japan's peace and um, stability. So this relates to the defense capabilities. And the third one is um, kind of really the broad idea for the humanity. But here, well, it, it's not only like nuclear disarmament he mentioned, but also mentioning about the data free flow with trust, which is quite interesting to see, um, um, to see this been included in the third pillar. So I may want to uh, kind of introduce some of the phrase that he have mentioned relating to the Japan's defense. So first I may want to kind of um, touch upon the collective self-defense, which was quite controversial um, before the 2015 um, like security law was passed. But um, already at a time when he was a foreign minister, well, he already said that, well, um, that even though there might be the concern about um, the accepting the right of collective self-defense, well, there, um, there may be the need to kind of, um, accept this collective self-defense. And um, I think I will read on the on this underlying part. So, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Kochika is known as a faction, which is seen as a liberal dovish, but um, Kishida mentioned in the, the, in the kind of one of the um, news article in 2014 saying that, well, there's a need to kind of, you know, um, think seriously about preserving the people's lives. And he said that we should not kind of really stick to this kind of ideological label such as conservative, liberal. So you do see there are maybe a slightly kind of um, different ideas, maybe from other coach kind members who might pertain to this kind of pacifist ideas. So um, uh, you do see that, well, he tried to kind of, you know, uh, see the importance of kind of understanding the relevance of collective self-defense and sorry that I will <laughs> uh, skip. And, and the, even like uh, last year, um, he do see the importance of this kind of collective self-defense. Um, looking at this mid of the expanding China's maritime uh, power and also those Korea issues. So we do see that um, regarding his attitude to collective self-defense, um, he, you know, he do, well, I may say that he may um, kind of, you know, um, you know, uh, have 
develop his kind of maybe realistic um, viewpoint on this regard. And talking about constitutional revision, which is uh, kind of really uh, one of the kind of uh, quite um, a major issue in Japan. Uh, like already, um, like, well, this is a kind of phrase that I um, kind of check on um, after he, you know, like elected in the LDP, uh, like president and also becoming a prime minister in Japan. He said that, well, he will be kind of, you know, aimed to implement the LDP proposal for amending the constitution, including the self-defense forces. So he also mentioned, well, today the uh, LDP secretary general is um, Mogi. So he said that he will kind of really um, like let him take a lead on uh, like, or well, like both. He also think that party reform is important. So like party reform and constitutional revision is a two important themes to be taken. So, but another thing that Kishida mentioned is that uh, while he think that, well, like, well, he's kind of really supporting for the constitutional revision, but he think that, well, like, not all four items suggested by the LDP members should be revised all at the same time, but maybe um, if, like, one, like, some of them are discussed, um, maybe not all of four items need to be revised at the same time. So this might be, um, can be considered as a kind of um, like careful uh, kind of um, attitude taken by Kishida. And well, like thinking about strengthening Japan's defense, well, this is um, certainly um, like Abe legacy that well, this national security strategy has been uh, kind of been important and, and this will be kind of um, revised um, by next year and not only the SS but national defense program guidelines and midterm defense program as well so um sorry that i couldn't really find the english translation so i translate this on my own so there is this kind of uh what well, conference or the meeting to um kind of um, plan of this revision um by name is this accelerating and strengthening defense capabilities so like Considering this kind of twist of the wording, we do see this kind of maybe urgency. Um, well, not personally from Kishida, maybe, but like by this kind of concern, actors like LDP lawmakers and so forth. But still, well, Kishida is in the position of not being able to specify the defense spending. So, um, but um, we need to kind of wait and see, um, like what kind of action he might take regarding this part. But another, um, like quite, uh, maybe from my viewpoint, quite uh, um, distinctive um, kind of um, um, posture taken by Kishida is regarding his um, affirmative action about the enemy base strike capabilities. So the reason why I say this is that even like um, prior to this like LDP presidential election or this, um, the general election. Well, but in March, he also mentioned this through Twitter of saying that direct attack against enemies is a launch capability is unnecessary. So now um, we do see that, well, well LDP law makes it because like quite a few of them are quite um, really um, um, kind of, um, you know, um, um, like stepping up for the talks for the, like, not only acquiring the capabilities to track enemy base, but also this kind of sharp increase in the Japan's defense budget. But maybe from um, the uh, lawmakers from Kochika, um, it may seem quite a kind of contradictory action from the the this um, like Kochika's um, ideas from what Kishida is mentioning regarding this enemy base strike capabilities, but maybe she does may argue that well, this is because of for the safety of the people. Uh, um, it is still quite debatable issue in this regard. And I mentioned like here like pro China, pro Taiwan, although um, I cannot really give the answer which side he might be, but he has been, um, from my view, have been quite careful in this regard that well, he already kind of, you know, um, you know, uh, mentioned about the concern on the Senkaku Islands, but 
the you know he also spoke with Xi Jinping saying that well they'll try to build a constructive stable relation. So and as I mentioned, Coach Kai has been like pro like China stance. So there's this kind of you know assumption whether um, Kishida have been trying to balance um carefully between the its relationship with China and um and also US. But then um we do see uh, he haven't uh, it hasn't been decided when he'll be able to visit the you uh, like visit us to meet um president biden but he is hoping to visit after uh like you know, a few um months um after becoming a uh, prime minister of japan but on um, the current plan that kishida is trying uh, is attempting to do is um like this relates to the taiwan issues so it is quite difficult to see about his position, although he has a kind of um, the willingness to have a kind of um, stronger tie with um, US by means of the alliance. So he attempted to kind of uh, hope to include a legal framework for the Security Act to be able to exercise the right of the collective self defense. And also, um, and I think there's also some of the kind of news mentioning that, well, he has, you know, while he visited um, Taiwan with um, prime, uh, the former Prime Minister Abe, well, he kind of helped Abe to drink the alcohol, which impressed the Taiwan Taiwanese um, lawmakers and give a kind of positive image on Kishida. And so Kishida also might have a kind of um, positive um, kind of attitude to Taiwan, like such as uh, welcoming the um, Taiwan's application to join the I, uh, the Trans-Pacific Strategic Economic Partnership, but still is not very clear about, uh, you know, which um, like side he may take, but he said clearly that what well, Taiwan Strait might become a next major diplomatic um, problem considering the um, Chinese um, influence of uh, Taiwan as well as Hong Kong. So, and he also mentioned that, well, the time has changed a lot and like there are this kind of really the authoritarian move, which is um, maybe implying China in this regard. So he said that, well, like, cause he will consider the distance between China, like from realistic perspective. So well, like, we do see some of this kind of um, maybe um, perhaps changing posture of Kishida. Well, another legacy of Abe that I may need to introduce is this um, a free and open in the Pacific and well, yeah, he clearly said that, well, he will uphold the, uphold the voice strategy and counterbalance the, the China's um, political assertiveness. So like we see that, well, he also quite actively um, kind of, you know, had this kind of, you know, engage in the Quad members and also, also um, had a meeting with ASEAN states to discuss about the free and open um, you know, in the Pacific and certainly, well, Abe um, introduced this um, regional concept in response to China's territorial claims and military buildup. And so I think um, Kishida will continue to uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, hold this um, like Abe's um, kind of, you know, initiative for the FOIP. And I will be brief in this regard, although it is quite interesting um, movement to focus on which is on economic security as well as human rights. So as I mentioned earlier, well, economic security is something that has been become an uh, 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 important issue, especially in the latter part of Abe administration. But under Kishida um, administration, well, the Economic Security Council launched with having the Kobayashi as a kind of um, the uh, representing for this council and um, before um, the yeah you know, or during Abe administration, well, there was this kind of working group of economic security, which uh, Kobashi even Kishida joined. So we do see that well, there have been a serious commitment. And about human rights, so even though um this um well this is really pretty much um um coming from the fact of you know seeing the rise of China as a Thread and also might be the China's assertive um, action regarding the legal issues. So indeed, with uh, like doing Abe administration, I will say that it wasn't really like 
of an initiative, but rather the bipartisan um, group on like, so this, um, this Japan's um, like kind of um, bipartisan group have been formed in um, discussing about the, the human rights issue of Uyghur and so forth. And Nakatani was one of the kind of um, the leading members of dealing with. So uh, under Kishida, what well, this human rights um, uh, kind of special advice on human rights was created and Nakatani become the, the um, I, um, for, uh, become an advisor for this. So in this regard, uh, maybe some people might think that Abe legacy had remains, but well, it, it might be too early to judge about, you know, how further um, Kishida might have carried on the Abe legacy, but at least um, Kishida managed, you know, he kind of stressed his concern about this clash between democracy and dictatorships. And when talking about dictatorship, um, he had um, China in his mind. But having said that, well, this is a recent Japanese article of even though human rights um, policy was kind of pretty much um, in the eyes of this China's um, kind of um, really um, attitude to this human rights issue, but um, it has been also reported in the like, Japanese like, um, news saying that, well, indeed, uh, uh, under Kishida administration, this uh, like human rights like diplomacy may kind of show like Kishida indecisiveness of maybe stressing that it is due to conf like it is because to confirm China, but rather like Kishida administration tries to reframe it just a general like human rights issue to be tackled. So um, like some of the experts kind of criticize about this. Maybe um, maybe some people may say a bit my mild um, posture made by Kishida um, when thinking about the rise of China. So sorry that it become a brief concluding remarks, but I'll be happy to receive the any question from yeah from the audience. So maybe this will be very brief on um, concluding remarks to make it, of course, because Kishida has started his second like term for as a prime minister, like just a few, like it has been only a few months. So it's it's still early to judge, but so far we do see that Kishida had inherited some of the achievement made by Abe was certainly very open um, in the Pacific and also the defense um, policy making. But having said that, well, this is uh, what he mentioned in the the, the Japanese magazine, um, of the December edition, although it was released in the November 10th, saying that, well, he said that even though, well, Abe have left the kind of legacy, but he also mentioned the number of things he is not allowed to freely um, gradually increasing. So it is something that we can maybe pay attention, maybe for example, about how he may deal with, about the human rights issue. So yeah, I haven't really have a clear conclusion at this point about, you know, uh, uh, what, about the position of Kishida, but so far what we can see is that, well, possibly Kishida is trying to act as a balancer of so like acting as a balancer among the factors including the um the LDP and the coach guy and so forth but um you do see that well he kind of claim himself a liberal conservative so um like this is um yeah the concluding remarks I have just now but um I will finish my talk here so thank you for your attention Okay, thank you very, very much, Professor Matsuoka. Uh, that was a very informative talk and very interesting. We do have, I think so far, maybe one or two questions. I would encourage members of the audience who are interested in asking a question to continue to use the chat box and to submit your question directly to Nora Heffernan. And I will get to audience questions in a minute but I, I'm going to briefly usurp my right um, as the moderator here because there's, there's something that I also want to ask you about. You didn't really talk very much about South Korea. Mm -hmm. And we all know that Japan's relationship with South Korea has been very strained since 2019. Um, I've, I'm actually not popular in Japan because of uh, some of the things I've written. 
Um, but, um, you know, I, I just looking at it, you know, trying to take sort of a, uh, you know, how, how do I see it? Um, it's very good that Kishida says that he, you know, he wants to be a little bit different from Abe. But so far, when it comes to South Korea, I don't see that too much. I still see a hard line. I don't see him putting South Korea back on the whitelist. Um, I, I still see them saying, well, you know, South Korea, you know, you, you have to first uh, get over the historical issues and then we'll talk. And I think for any South Korean president, that's a non-starter. So I just, um, I just wonder what the prospects are for improved relations between uh, Japan and South Korea uh, under Kishida. Yeah, that is a very difficult question to answer, although very good question. And I was also thinking about how, you know, how we can um, interpret from Kishida behavior. And I think as you mentioned, and uh, maybe um, how you feel, yeah. Indeed, this, there are quite a few like LDP lawmakers we, who may have a, this kind of hard line on South Korea issues. So I think at this moment, Kishida may not been able to kind of really, um, you know, like present like maybe his own um, like um, personal view, but rather really like consensual manner, <laughs> like following um, like maybe um, develop, yeah, like, yeah, um, following this policy making. Although, yeah, but he, yeah, so he, the way he behaves is quite um, pretty much like, showing like the good aspects to everyone. Uh, yeah, there's uh, some of the phrase in Japanese, but I don't know how to say that, but yeah. So like, he also mentioned that, well, he favored like Korean culture. So, you know, I don't know like how influential that kind of comments may be. And so I think for a while, and you do see that this deepening um, worsen relationship between Japan and South Korea have really deepened like, and yeah, it is also said that um, Abe, yeah, that is uh, kind of one of the kind of, uh, well, failure might be a too strong word, but yeah, this is one of the kind of remaining problem which Abe left, yeah, like, you know, after leaving as a prime minister. So yes, at this moment, it's really, yeah, kind of quite stagnant moment, I will say. So it will take time to um, like um, ameliorate this situation. I think. Although I'm not saying that, well, there won't be a positive future, but under Kishida, we may see a maybe slow progress in this regard. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to go to some of the questions from the audience now. And I'm, what I'm going to actually try to do is combine a couple of the questions because as I, I, I was sort of asking my question because at first there weren't that many questions that came in and now we have a few. Uh, but I would say um, a, a number of the questions are related to Taiwan. And of course, that's something that's been very interesting because there's been a change in Japanese rhetoric, I think, uh, related to uh, the, the Taiwan issue. And so um, first, there's, there's one anonymous question that says, uh, that asks this, how will the self-defense concept be changed in relation to Taiwan? And then, uh, Stuart Kaplan actually asks um, a, another or actually a, a number of questions that are along this line. How would Japan respond to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan or to an invasion of one or more of the outlying Taiwanese islands such as Jinmin and Maza? Mm. Yeah, very good question. And as I mentioned, well, like, I think Shida has trying to have a kind of good relationship with U.S. and means of the alliance. And yeah, as I mentioned in the talk, well, that Shida has been think that collective self defense, um, like um, is a uh, kind of one of the right which Japan may be able to exercise. So this also relate to LDP proposal about kind of changing some of the constitution regarding self defense force. So uh, although I don't think it will become like smooth change, like there will be a lot of kind of debates and because Kishida is not like only a top down, but also bottom up 
So um, I won't, yeah, it, yeah, I'm also not very sure whether this kind of, for example, this constitutional revision will be smoothly to see, um, take into account of it also, Kishida being a, like, you know, Kochikai faction member. But, uh, yeah, but having said that, because within a Japanese, like, um, pers like uh, well, from Japanese perspective, it seems that this dichotomy of this democracy and dictatorship has been kind of really um, one of the kind of really framework to see and you know like you know dictatorship or autocracy is not good so um so maybe possibly there is this kind of you know um uh, yeah the change about you know how self-defense forces might be engaged in the means of the collective self-defense yes yeah, so but uh, yeah, that is a uh, you know the answer that I have at this moment. I hope that answers the questions that have been covered. Yes, thank you. You know, Taiwan is such um, an, an interesting issue now and becoming so much more prominent uh, because of recent developments. You know, both uh, both developments across the Taiwan Strait between China and Taiwan, but also um, you know you because of developments in Hong Kong in the last few years. So it's something that's been very much on everyone's mind. But I, I think the next question, I'm going to take you in a different direction. This is actually a more public question in the chat box. But I think I think I want to ask this one by uh, from Un Jung Chue. Uh, I, I hope she can hear me because she was uh, saying before that she couldn't. Uh, but um, I think um, what, what she's asking about is Japanese domestic politics. And, you know, this is something I'm actually also very curious about. I mean, I think under Shinzo Abe, he very much seemed to have uh, pretty strong control over the party uh, for a, a pretty good long period of time. Uh, but now you have um, a new foreign minister, Kishida, uh, not foreign minister, I'm sorry, new new leader, uh, <laughs> Kushida. Um, and, and so uh, Unjung is asking, how can Kushida maintain his power in the party among the supporters? And I, I would just go back to something you said, like, will will Shinzo Abe sort of be lurking in the background? And, and you know, how would, if he is, how would that impact Kushida's ability to maintain support in the party? Mm, that's a, also another good point to focus on, and it's it might be early, uh, too early for me to maybe answer this question. But still, like what Kishida had mentioned recently is that well, as I introduced in the last slide, if I remember correctly, uh, he said that he have increasing more freedom to do what he wants to do, and I think that is quite observable when it comes to like human rights, um, like issues or economy. So while, you know, doing, you know, Shinzo Abe, that is something really clearly seen as like confronting China. But then now, like maybe along with this so-called humane diplomacy, which Kishida wants to kind of push for, you know, you do see a kind of really um, like lessening, like reducing this China's like kind of, you know, like confronting China. So, but really, yeah, Abe and Kishida is quite different that Abe was really, again, like quite top down and really um, have strengthened this Kante and, you know, really kind of really um, strategically able to maybe um, change the defense of Japan. While Kishida is quite, a, I will say, consensual type. He tried to take everyone's opinion, or I won't say that, maybe he's trying to do that strategically. So, I'm, yeah, like it's, yeah, be, but then having said that, well, even though Abe was quite um, strong, like maintaining his power, but having said that, he also had the problem of like domestic problems such as um, this corruption, this Morikake, and so forth. And after that, well, people, like Japanese people, become very suspicious. So now, like Kishida is not really acting in that way. So I assume that uh, Kishida won't, like, you know, he will last not very like short, but maybe relatively longer because you know he's not really like clearly stating and he's kind of picking up some of the important words which the like LDP lawmakers supporters um want to need about like China. So I think that is related to like strike um, capabilities issue. 
So uh, I'm not sure whether he will maintain as long as Abe would. And again, well, depending on the ability of Kishida may have on doing his term, yeah, Abe might, you know, kind of, you know, uh, whisper behind the scene and maybe give it a voice. So it's really, I cannot really clearly um, argue that, okay, Abe is disappearing from the scene yet. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think that's about as good an answer as you you could come up with. I just, you know, for me, I I, I mean, I I can remember, I and I think most people can remember the the time sort of uh, pre Abe, where uh, you know the Japanese uh, prime ministers didn't really last, you know, tended not to last more than three or four years. I think there was sort of an extended period and you know so Abe Abe was the outlier and so it, it will be interesting though to see um, you, does, does that continue uh, you know uh, will will anything be learned or, or you know was that just um, you know Abe was a masterful politician and he did that but no one else can do it so I, I think that's sort of uh, you know very interesting uh, very interesting discussion. So we actually have a few other questions. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to, to get to at least a couple of them. I, I think this one you answered, I guess, uh, you, you mentioned this to some degree in your talk, but I guess the, this question wants a little bit more depth. And that is about this uh, quad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this has been something obviously that the United States is placing so much uh, more emphasis on and, and even trying to formalize it a little bit. So uh, this, the question that came in is um, how, um, you know, uh, how does Kishida view the quad and, um, you know, what, uh, what direction do you think he uh, wants to move the quad in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is also another important topic to take into account thinking like, well, not only about like Kishida administration, but also like, you know, US, yeah, Japan alliance, or even about in the Pacific. And so far, what I see from Kishida um, attitude toward Quad as well as um, US alliance is that um, I think I slightly missed, well, I mentioned this in the talk, but it seems that, well, Kishida at least see US Japan alliance very important. And I do see that he's, well, of course, and it's not only Kishida who might want to see uh, president, US president after like few months, they become prime minister. So it may not be uniquely about Kishida, but, but still he's trying to show that, you know, the US Japan alliance is very important. And that also may affect how, you know, he um, may act. Um, like as a Japanese prime minister for Quad. So I think he will really um, see it important. But having said that, I'm, you know, I'm also quite interested in seeing whether, you know, how further the, this kind of discourse about China will be strengthened because Quad is something that turned out to be the kind of uh, the group which consider not only like kind of military, but also like kind of COVID-19. So, you know, it's kind of widened the kind of areas of the kind of uh, concerns or maybe security. But still, yeah, I think so far what I can say that, yeah, I think, um, yeah, under Kishida administration, well, Quad will be like working as the kind of important role within the Japanese foreign policy making. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, one, uh, I guess we may have time for one, uh, one more question maybe. Uh, Stuart Kaplan also, ha he actually asked a couple of others, um, but let me just uh, pick one of them here. And uh, thank you, Stuart, for sending so many thoughtful questions. I really appreciated it. Um, but he, he asks um, about nuclear weapons in particular. And, and of course, we know, you know J Japan thus far hasn't really, uh, it's, it's, it has nuclear power, but it hasn't been nuclear armed. Um, and so he asks, how do you think other nations in Asia would respond to a nuclear armed Japan? Would this prompt South Korea to also secure its own nuclear weaponry, which is, uh, you know, I, my, my own, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm sort of, uh, you know, I, I think that's actually, from what I know, it, it is something 
um, that there's there's some talk about in South Korea, but I haven't I haven't seen you know any uh, definitive um, you know any clear plan. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, as long as as long as there's they're under you know the U.S. protective umbrella, but. Um, I, I would just add to Stuart's question, you know, is there even a prospect uh, for Japan to move in that direction um, with, you know, if it feels there's a growing threat from nuclear armed China and nuclear armed North Korea, is there, you know, is there a prospect of Japan saying, you know, uh, we've been non-nuclear for a long time, it's the, the, the United States isn't as reliable as it used to be. It's time to develop our own nuclear weapons. Uh, I may say, well, at least um, under, well, at least from Kishida perspective, I don't think he wants to go that direction. And but and like maybe like being protected under this U.S. nuclear umbrella is one of the kind of idea he has it personally. So I think that yeah, Japan won't had to kind of really try to hold a nuclear like arms, although it has a nuclear power and some of this kind of maybe revisionism like politicians say, okay, yeah, that is like, you know, like, you know, holding like plutonium is that is like one way that show that Japan may have a potential to have a nuclear arms. But so I, yeah, so far um, from my view, I don't think under Kishida and he's, yeah, again, he's a, you know, you know, representing like Hiroshima. And I don't think, you know, once he said that maybe he will lose the support. So I don't think he will take that risk. And, uh, but having said that, well, we also need to pay attention to this, of uh, the opinion of the LDP lawmakers who support him. But I think, yeah, it's, yeah, in the, yeah, like under Kishida at least, um, I don't think, <laughs> yeah, like Japan will try to join that kind of nuclear like arms race, but yeah, yeah, that is my yeah opinion. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very interesting. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I guess um, there, there might be a growing emphasis on um, strengthening Japan's defenses, but it would probably be primarily oriented towards uh, conventional defense yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of nuclear. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, I think this has been a, a very, very interesting talk. I'd like to thank uh, members of the audience very much for joining us. And um, I'd like to thank, uh, once again, uh, Professor Matsuoka. Uh, it's early, early in the morning uh, for her in Japan. Whenever we do these, um, you know, unfortunately, we can't fly people in as easily as we used to. So, um, you know, we, we Zoom and, and one person ends up being early in the morning and one person ends up being, uh, you know, after supper time. But I, I hope that everybody has enjoyed the talk. Um, I've appreciated the questions. And um, yes, thank you all for joining us.